In the last Torah portion, the children of Israel refused to go into the land that God promised to give to them. As a result, the entire generation that came out of Egypt would remain in the wilderness for 40 years and die there, never seeing the fulfillment of God's promise. However, exactly 40 years from their deliverance, the next generation would go into the land. The rejection of the land occurred in the fifth month of the second year from their deliverance from Egypt. That leaves 38 years and seven months to go before the new generation would enter the land. The Torah relates only one event that occurred during these years before it picks up the story of the journey to the land on the first day of the first month of the beginning of the 40th year with the death of Miriam. The event that was recorded during the time between the second and 40th years in the wilderness was the rebellion against Moses and Aaron led by their cousin Korach. Why did God preserve this event out of all the events that must have happened during these years? What is God communicating to future generations of Israel and to us thousands of years later? I'm Brenda Cathcart, and this is Words from Our Father. We are not told the date of Korach's rebellion, but biblical commentators who speculate on the timing believe it happened shortly after the children of Israel were sentenced to live out their lives in the wilderness. At that time, Moses and Aaron relayed God's judgment for their grumbling and rebellion. Numbers 14, 26-29 The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. And your corpses will fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number, from twenty years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Notice that the word of the Lord came through both Moses and Aaron. After hearing these words from Aaron and Moses, the armies of Israel tried to take the land by their own strength. They were soundly defeated and driven away from Kadesh, which was in the wilderness of Paran. In this context, several questions need to be asked. What future did this generation see for themselves? Where would they go now that they couldn't take the land of the Canaanites? Did Korach believe that God really said they would die in the wilderness? The complaints began with Korach, a Levite of the family of Kohath. Numbers 16, 1 and 2. Now Korach, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, took both Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben. Even they rose up before Moses with some of the sons of Israel, 250 rulers of the assembly, elect men in the congregation, men who were well known. The root of Korach's discontent may have been that he was passed over for the role of captain of the Kohathites in favor of Elizaphon, the son of Kohath's youngest son. Korak wins over three leaders of the tribe of Reuben, Dathan, Abiram, and On, to his cause. Together, they influenced 250 more men who were all well-known leaders in the congregation. This rebellion, which started in the inner camp of the Levites, spread to the south side of the camp, where the tribe of Reuben was the leading tribe. From there, it spread throughout the camp. When the rebellion was fully formed, they confronted Moses and Aaron and brought their charges against them. Number 16.3 They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Just like the serpent in the Garden of Eden twisted God's words when he tempted Adam and Eve, Korach used a twisted version of the truth to support an outright false statement. 
The opening statement accused Moses and Aaron of exalting themselves above the rest of the congregation through their offices of high priest and leader. This goes back to Mount Sinai when God spoke the ten words to all of the congregation. At that time, the children of Israel were so frightened that they implored Moses to speak to God for them. Exodus 20, 18 and 19. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. In the case of Moses, first God and then the children of Israel appointed Moses to speak to God. God emphasizes Moses' status with him when Aaron and Miriam complained that Moses set himself apart from them. Numbers 12, 6 through 8. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face even plainly and not in dark sayings, and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? As for Aaron, God chose Aaron while they were still in Egypt. He was the one God chose to go out and meet Moses on Mount Sinai and accompany him back to Egypt. God's choice of Aaron and Moses was confirmed when the fire of God consumed the offering on the altar, when Aaron and Moses entered the tabernacle together, and then exited and blessed the people. Leviticus 9, 23 and 24. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Korok's outright false accusation that Moses and Aaron exalted themselves to positions of authority is supported by a perversion of the truth. Korok states that all of the congregation is holy. It is true that the children of Israel were called to be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. However, Korach failed to pay attention to the requirement that they must obey God's voice in order to be holy to the Lord. The second supporting statement that God is among the entire congregation is also true. However, when the tabernacle was set up, not even Moses could draw near. In order to draw near, the children of Israel had to go through the priesthood and bring the proper offerings. Even the arrangement of the camp was to protect the sanctity of the tabernacle and preserve the lives of the people. Korach chose to ignore these restrictions that, even though God dwelled among them, they couldn't casually draw near to him. The British Family Bible comments on these claims by Korach. Every word of this speech was a falsehood. Instead of lifting himself up, Moses humbled himself. Who am I? It was God who lifted him up over Israel, and Israel was as holy as Moses was ambitious. What holiness was there in so much infidelity, fear, idolatry, mutiny, disobedience? They were still fresh from their last obstinacy, yet these flatterers say all Israel is holy. Moses recognized that Korach's complaint was not really against either him or Aaron. It was against the Lord. He refers Korach's argument to the Lord. Numbers 16, 4-7 so when Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korach and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this, 
Take censers, Korak, and all your company. Put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Moses turns the accusation of Korak back on Korak and his supporters. He specifically addresses the sons of Levi among the rebels. God had already honored and set apart the entire tribe of Levi to serve the priests and the tabernacle on behalf of the rest of Israel. Yet these Levites wanted a greater honor. They wanted the priesthood. Numbers 16, 8 through 11. Then Moses said to Korach, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you? And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? The test of who is holy is reminiscent of events at the dedication of the tabernacle when Nadab and Abihu offered incense to the Lord using strange fire. The fire of God came out and consumed Nadab and Abihu. After singling out the Levites among the followers of Korach, Moses then turned his attention to Dathan and Abiram of the tribe of Reuben. When Moses calls for them, they refuse to appear before Moses, implying that it is his leadership that they are rejecting, not God's leadership. Numbers 16, 12 through 14. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Moses had asked the Levites if it was a small thing that God had separated them out to draw near to him and do the work of the tabernacle. Dathan and Abiram returned the question to Moses, asking if it was a small thing that Moses, not God, but Moses brought them out of Egypt and didn't bring them into the promised land. When the ten spies told the congregation that they couldn't defeat the armies of Canaan, the people complained that God had brought them out of Egypt to kill them. They called for new leadership. Numbers 14, 3 and 4. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. It seems that Dathan and Abiram are pursuing this call for a new leader. Who would be better to lead the children of Israel than Dathan and Abiram, the descendants of Jacob's first son, Reuben? They blamed Moses for not taking them into the promised land when it was their own fault that they rejected the land. As a further insult against God, Dathan and Abiram slandered God by calling Egypt a land flowing with milk and honey. Joshua and Caleb, while remonstrating with the children of Israel to take the promised land, refer to the promised land as a land of milk and honey. Numbers 14, 8. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Dathan and Abiram refused to participate in the test of who is holy and who could draw near to God. The next morning, the 250 men, along with Aaron, gathered to offer incense to the Lord. Korah gathered all the congregation to watch the proceedings. Numbers 16, 17 through 19. Let each take his censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord, 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So each man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron.
And Korach gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Notice that it is the 250 men who attempt to offer incense, while the leaders of the rebellion stand back and watch. When God saw the congregation gathered together against Moses and Aaron, it angered him so much that he was ready to destroy the entire congregation. After Moses pled with God to only destroy the guilty, Moses went to the tents of Korach, Dathan, and Abiram. Korach and the congregation went with him. Numbers 16, 25 through 27. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korach, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. Moses asked God to destroy Korach, Dathan, and Abiram in such a way that the congregation would know without a doubt that it was God who was bringing judgment on them, not Moses. God responded by opening the earth and swallowing them. Numbers 16, 31 to 33. Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korach, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly." At the same time, the other 250 rebels, along with Aaron, were at the door of the tabernacle, preparing to offer incense. The fire of the Lord came out and consumed them, just like it had done to Nadab and Abihu. Numbers 16, 35. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. God dramatically demonstrated who was his who was holy, and who could draw near to him. Of those offering incense, only Aaron remained alive. The children of Israel could not draw near to God without going through Aaron and his sons, the chosen priests who were holy to the Lord. We, as believers in Yeshua as our high priest, cannot draw near to God without going through Yeshua. Without him, it is as if we are offering strange fire to the Lord. The next day, the people, reeling from the destruction of Korach, Dathan, Abiram, and 250 of their leaders, lashed out once more against Moses. They blamed Moses for killing the people of the Lord. Numbers 1641. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. They could not accept their own guilt in supporting Korach and his rebellion. Perhaps they could not accept the consequences of their own actions when they rejected the land. God's anger was roused against the congregation in the form of a plague which began to rage through the congregation. Numbers 16, 46 through 48. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly, and already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people, and he stood between the dead and the living so the plague was stopped. Aaron's act of bringing the smoke and scent of the incense into the congregation to stop the plague emphasized that Aaron is the one who belonged to God, who was holy, and who could draw near to God. The previous day, God's fire consumed all those who brought the incense contrary to God's instructions. Now the incense offered by Aaron brings their deliverance from the plague. To drive this point home, the leader of each tribe was instructed to bring the staff of their office to lay before the Lord in the tabernacle, where God would choose the staff of the man that God chose. 
Aaron's staff came to life. Number 17, 8. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds, had produced blossoms, and yielded ripe almonds. The children of Israel would not be selecting a new leader and returning to Egypt. They would remain in the wilderness and die there according to their own words. Aaron and his sons would remain priests before the Lord. The Levites would retain their position as servants doing the work of the tabernacle. The Levites were taken in the place of the firstborn to belong to God. They were chosen to be holy to God and draw near to Him. Leadership of the children of Israel would change. The book of Judges shows that God selected judges from many of the tribes, but the priesthood would remain unchanging. This is the last event the scriptures record about the generation of the children of Israel that came out of Egypt. It closes out God's dealings with them. They started out of Egypt with such hope and promise, but they fell short. They did not enter the promised land. However, God's promise remains. Yahovah is God. There is no other. He will rule over his people. I'm Brenda Cathcart for Moed Ministries International. Shalom and be blessed.